The first of our speakers is going to be Giles Thomas. Giles started programming Python when founding a business. He wanted to revolutionize the spreadsheet world by making spreadsheets programmable. And then he tried to sell them to financial companies. That didn't work. <laughs> then his team moved over to producing the Python system that they wanted for people like themselves. And that sold a lot better. Giles is also playing the guitar. Today, today, however, he is going to take you on a journey. The journey of an HTTP request through a platform as a service. Please welcome with a hot applause, Giles Thomas. Oh, thanks for an excellent introduction. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so, um, yeah. The thing that we wrote, the thing that we thought that uh, we, we were going to build, the Python uh, system that we wanted is called Python Anywhere. It's a platform as a service. It does lots of things. One thing that it does is that it hosts a fair number of websites. Um, so, just wanted to get a general feeling um, about how much people in the room know about uh, running websites. Um, how many people here are um, responsible for the continued operation of a website? Maybe a personal blog or company pages? Okay, so... A fair, a fair number, yeah, that's maybe 50%. Let's uh, say, let's bring that up a little bit. How many are responsible for several websites? Okay, more than 10? Still a few. More than 100? Still one. More than 1,000? Okay, I'm not going I'm, I'm to keep, keep going up because it'll be really embarrassing. It'll turn out that you actually run more websites than we do. We have 24,241 websites running on Python Anywhere as of this morning. Um, actually, probably a few more by, by now. Um, and we've got an infrastructure to run this. It's a simple platform as a service infrastructure. I'm going to go through a description of it pretty quickly, touching on a few of the details. But what I'd like to do is leave quite a lot of time for questions because I think which bits are interesting to drill down into will probably come more from you guys than from me guessing at what you're going to be interested in. Um, the websites we have, they range from very basic things where somebody has basically started using a particular framework, so somebody here has been trying out uh, web to pi um, And, you know, maybe they're going to build something, it'll get a visitor a day, maybe they're just, they're just a hobbyist experimenting. The next stage is maybe sites which get a couple of hundred visitors a day. Um, this guy is uh, learning Mandarin Chinese in a particular way, he's sharing his, uh, his lessons with a few other people. Um, so a couple of hundred visitors a day. Um, we want to spend almost no resources on the first kind, enough resources to keep this kind of site responsible, sorry, responsive even. Other people are running moderately technical, uh, popular technical blogs. This is my colleague Harry's Obey the Testing Goat. It's a companion site for a book he's uh, written, which is awesome, and you should totally buy it if you're interested in test-driven development with Python and Django. Um, but he gets maybe 2,000 visitors a day. So the site needs to be responsive, it needs to be up all the time, but um, it doesn't need that much more than uh, that. It's not a high-volume site. This is one of our most fun customers. This guy is running a site, and it's insanely popular. It gets uh, you know, dozens of hits every second uh, pouring through there. It's actually quite a good selection of music, even if you don't like um, getting out of your head and various things. But um, it's, again, quite a popular website. It's not Amazon, it's not Google, but it's got to be there, it's got to be responsive, and it's got to be uh, maintained at an affordable uh, price. So, how do we do this? Well. Here's a very basic list of, well, it's a set of logos. These are the, these are the tools that we use. We use uh, GNU Linux, obviously. We use Nginx for our, um, for our load balancing, for all of our uh, HTTP needs. Um, we use uWSGI, which is an absolutely awesome product which, uh, which manages Python processes for you so that they can serve up web applications. It can serve basically any uh, web application that uses the, uh, the WSGI protocol. So that's, that's going to be Django, that's web to pi that's Bottle, that's Flask, that's all of the big ones, possibly, except for, except for most Tornado installations, which doesn't play so well with uh, Whiskey. Um, we do use Redis. I'm not going to go into much detail on that today. Uh, we also use Lua for a certain amount of scripting. Now, I know I'm in a bit of danger here for talking about the ones of Lua at a Python conference, but um, we do use it. It's awesome for what it does for the specific use case we have. Now, you'll notice that I've got Django and I've got Python there. I didn't mention them. Well, all of our infrastructure uses the tools that I've described so far. 
all of the configuration is managed by Python. It's, run by, it's managed by a number of Django applications, um, which basically spit out the configuration files that all the other stuff needs to run and uh, keeps, the, keeps the cluster live and doing what it's meant to do. So I promised a description of a, of a HTTP request journey through, uh, through this platform as a service. And here are the machines that are involved in that. So you can see what I have here is uh, up in the top left, let's use the mouse pointer, uh, you can see each of these blue boxes is a, se is a separate physical machine or a separate um, instance running on Amazon AWS or whatever. Here's the user's laptop, he's running Chrome. Down here we have a load balancer and a bunch of back-end servers. So everything apart from this machine up here in the top left is part of Python Anywhere's infrastructure. We run on Amazon AWS, but that's kind of, um, that's not particularly relevant to this, uh, the, the context of this talk. Um, let's say that the person who's, uh, who's, who's running the browser up here wants to view my friend Harry's website. They want to go to visit www.obeythetestinggoat.com. Well, their browser makes a DNS request. The DNS request comes back with the IP address of obeythetestinggoat.com, which is the IP address of this load balancer down here. So it opens up, an H it opens up a uh, TCP IP connection down to the load balancer. It sends the request to the load balancer. Now, in order to route it through to the web application, let's say that obey the testing goat is this web application here. It's this Python process that's running over on this particular physical machine, the middle one on the right-hand side, if you can't see the mouse pointer. Um, so the load balancer needs to have the intelligence to be able to, uh, to know that obey the testing goat.com is running on backends of server two. So we'll just say that's magic for the moment. Let's say it magically knows backend server two. It makes a connection and, um, and now we have two TCP IP connections, one from the, from the client to the load balancer, one from the load balancer to the back end. The back end now needs to identify that the process web app 4 is the Python process that's running obey the testing goat.com. It does that, again, we'll say magically, and um, makes the connection. The web application code does its calculations, it renders templates, it talks to the database, it does whatever magic it does to generate a page. It sends it back to the back end server, back end server sends it back to the load balancer, load balancer sends it back to the client. Now, if you're used to running um, normal kinds of websites, the kind of system where, I personally, for example, I have a VPS where I, where I uh, used to host my, uh, my personal blog, then you might be thinking, what's the point of the load balancer in there? Because normally, you just simply have a server that looks rather like the, uh, the back-end server here. It's running a front-end web server like Nginx or Apache, and it's got a number of web applications running, one or more uh, web applications running as Python processes underneath it. Why do we have this extra step for the load balancer? Well, that's kind of where the magic comes in because that's, uh, it's the load balancer that allows us to scale up, to scale down, to add in uh, resilience and failover and all those other good things that people expect when they outsource running their web uh, applications to a third party like us rather than renting a VPS. Right, so I said the load balancer knows by magic which, uh, which back end it's got to send that, uh, send that request to. Our load balancer is running Nginx. It's running a specific uh, flavor of Nginx called OpenResty. Now, Nginx is an awesome web server. It has, um, it's extremely fast. It's very good at proxying um, uh, connections through it like we do through the load balancer. And it has a lot of great plugins. OpenResty is basically Nginx with batteries included. One of the batteries that are in, that's included is Lua scripting. The kind of Lua scripting you can do is actually insanely powerful. You can do any amount of Lua processing inside every single request. It works extremely fast. Lua, I think, is a nice language. It's not as nice as Python, but some of the um, design decisions they made that make it a less pleasant language to look at and work with are actually very good for, uh, for speed and, and efficiency. So that's why it's, I think they chose it for, the, for the, the majority of Nginx scripting. What we do inside our load balancer code is actually really very simple. Um, what I've got here is the Nginx configuration file. Um, hopefully that's reasonably readable. At the top here, we're saying, init by Lua file, when Nginx starts up, it's going to load, it's going to run that script, init backends. Init backends basically just uh, specifies some global context which is available to any Lua script inside uh, Nginx saying, here is a list of all of the backend servers. That's all it does. As we go down here, we come into our server block, so we're listing on ports 80 and uh, 443, and this location slash block is basically something that's going to be executed. Think of it as code that's executed for every request. So what we do is we extract the host that a particular, um, that, that uh, this request is asking for, www.obeythetestinggoat.com. 
we extract it uh, from the HTTP host uh, header from the HTTP request and st stash in a variable called root host. We then set a backend IP variable to an empty string. And then this is basically a function call here. We're calling the Lua function that's, cont that's contained in get backend IP. Now, you can guess what get backend IP does. It returns the IP in, in this uh, backend IP variable. And then we go into this little bit of Nginx magic, which is proxy pass. So that says, just hand off the processing of this request to that server over there, identified by this IP. And um, Nginx does the rest for us. Let's take a look at uh, that uh, Lua file. This is an interesting bit of code because it was something we put in for the first cut of our load balancer, which we thought we were going to get rid of in a week or so. It seemed too simple. It seemed too, um, uh, what's the word? It didn't seem complicated enough to work. All it does is hash the host name that comes in. So that's, that's literally the code that uh, Python uses when you hash a string, uh, to convert it into Lua. It hashes that, so you've got a number from the host name. We then take that modulo the number of backends and use that to index into the list of uh, backends. So that means that every single web, uh, web server we're running, every single website we're running, is assigned essentially randomly to one of the different backends. It's stably assigned to the same backend. If we add new backends to the cluster, the modulus uh, number we're using increases, and so everything automatically spreads itself out over the cluster again. That's the load balancer. I said that the backend server also needs to identify which, uh, which process is running a particular web application. So this is some really basic Nginx configuration that any of you who've done UWSGI uh, stuff on um, Nginx will recognize. All we're saying here is, again, extract the domain name that from the request that's being made uh, to, uh, from the request we're processing. Different way of doing it, but the same effect. And what we, do, what we say, uh, tell Nginx to do is delegate all requests for www.obeythetestinggo.com to a particular socket. This is all dynamic stuff. This is, uh, this, this is what the config actually looks like. It's not a sample there. So any request that comes into this Nginx, it will immediately look for that, a socket in that particular location and expect there to be a UWSGI process sitting on the other end of it running the, um, running the website that should be on that particular domain. How does, um, how do, how does UWSGI know that it needs to have a, a web application running on that socket? Well, UWSGI has a directory called, uh, it, it contains what they call vassal files. A vassal is UWSGI's terminology for a running Python process or set of processes that's responsible for a particular web application. Um, it's configured by a vassal file, and a vassal file basically has various things saying where the code is, what kind of sandboxing you want to apply, how, how many worker processes you want. But importantly, it also has um, this line at the top here, <coughs> excuse me, um, which, is, <coughs> which is the socket that it needs to listen on. UWSGI is very clever. If a vassal file is created, configuring a, uh, a UWSGI vassal like this, it will immediately detect the, the creation of that file, if it's in the right directory, and it will file up, fire up all the processes immediately. And then that, and that means that obviously the web application has started. So what we need to do is start um, a web application when requests come in. This is where things get a little bit more complicated. What happens if a request comes into one of our backends and there is no process running for that particular uh, web application? Well, I told you the Nginx I showed you earlier was simplified. Here's something a bit closer to the truth. When Nginx tries to connect to a, uh, to a, to a UWSGI backend that's not there, maybe there's no socket, maybe UWSGI itself hasn't started the processes, maybe it's killed them because they timed out after um, a certain amount of inactivity, Nginx will internally generate a 502 error. Normally that just goes back to the, uh, the browser and you know, obviously things look bad. What we have here is an uh, error page handler. If there is a 502 error, we essentially do a go to to this other block here at fallback. Error page 502, if there is a, um, if there's an error, we wind up inside this code here. And all we do here is we check whether there is a vassal file for that particular domain. So let's say we go to, we're looking for www.obeythetestinggoat.com. <coughs> the process isn't running. The first thing we do is jump to this, this fallback. We see whether there's a vassal file for that domain. If there's a vassal file for that domain, we can safely assume that there are processes running. So actually, this was a real 502. Maybe something wrong, went wrong inside the web application. So we generate a real 502 error. But if there isn't a, a vassal file for that particular web app, we know we need to start it. Now, you remember that proxy pass from the load balancer where essentially we're saying delegate all work for this request to this IP over there. This is another proxy pass here, which is delegating to a little microservice running locally. The microservice running locally is actually a very small Django application. It has access to the database that configures all of the websites we run. 
when it receives a call on its uh, initialized web app um, view, then it says, okay, I need to start up that particular web application. It goes to the database, it gathers all the information about the user, it works out whether we have a, um, a virtual um, uh, a, a container for this particular user running on this particular machine. It starts that up if necessary. It then creates the, the whiskey configuration. It generates a whiskey.ne file, the vassal file, passes that off to, uh, to you, whiskey. You, whiskey starts the process uh, uh, up and running, and suddenly we can start delegating all the work to that. So, why is this interesting? Well, what it means is that we can actually scale pretty much transparently. Let's say we've had a busy day, and we, let's imagine we've only had, until now, say, three web servers in our cluster, and then suddenly things, uh, things hot up. Maybe uh, the, the web applications we've got are a bit getting more busy, or a bunch of new people have signed up, and we've got to serve more websites. All we do is we create a new backend uh, server, which is very easy with Amazon. We just fire up a new instance, and then we tell the load balancer about it. Immediately, on, uh, on telling uh, Nginx to uh, reload its configuration, it will start distributing re requests differently across the load balance, sorry, across the backends, and any backends that uh, need to start web apps will automatically start them. The ones that are running uh, uh, web applications that they no longer need to run will all start timing out and uh, killing themselves. So we've dynamically reconfigured the cluster very, very simply. Now let's say that something goes wrong. Last night, um, one of our web, our web uh, servers started showing problems, and so uh, we got uh, pinged by, uh, by Pingdom saying Live Web One was, go was going down. Live Web One is a particular server that we have on uh, Amazon, and every year about this time, hardware starts failing on, on AWS. I think what happens is that all the er their uh, regular engineers go on holiday, and the interns haven't been, been given enough information on how to manage their, uh, their systems. Live Web One started failing. And so all we did was log into, a, log in, into the load balancer, remove it from our, uh, from our list of backends, everything then immediately reconfigured itself automatically just through the use of this hashing function to run on the remaining servers. That meant that, of course, all of the, <coughs> the web apps were running a little bit more slowly because our machines were uh, closer to their load limit, but that's fine. We have a <coughs> fair amount of capacity for that. We, we could bounce the web server. So, sorry, we could bounce, fix the broken server, bring it, bring it back into rotation with a new IP, and suddenly everything worked again. That it was a very, very rapid tour through uh, how, our, how, how the whole system works. And now I'd really like to hand over to you guys for any questions. We can drill down on anything that was interesting. Thank you. So we got a lot of time for questions. Gentleman here at the front. Uh, About the initialized web app script, uh, could you just use your uh, whiskey to automatically start the Python process instead? So why would you not use that function? Um, the real, the real problem is actually in the amount of work that needs to be done to start the process, because all of our users run inside um, inside sandbox environments which we have to have control over the code to actually start them up. And you always get the time where we started using it, and I think still doesn't have the capability to, um, to do all of the setup work required to do it. It can start processes quite happily. It can run certain kinds of pre-init scripts. Um, I don't recall precisely what, but there was something that it could not do to, it was, to, to, to do with the virtualization, essentially. Uh, first question, how do you do the sandboxing? The sandboxing? Okay, it's, um, it's kind of a roll your own thing. Um, these, uh, these days, if we're starting Python anywhere today, we might think of, we'd probably use Linux containers, or we'd um, potentially use Docker. We're using Docker for uh, some uh, stuff we're working on now and thinking of rolling some changes back in. But the good thing about Linux containers is that it was built out of reusable components. It uses true roots, it uses process namespaces, network namespaces, and that meant that all of these have been becoming available for a number of, um, for, you know, for a number of years, and we've essentially rolled our own kind of Linux containers light by plugging those things together. Okay, and what happens if, um, if a worker is down, and uh, let's say three requests come in at the same time? Is there, there's some kind of a race condition here, right? Sorry, I, I, I don't think I understood that. So if you need to start a, a process, a whiskey process, mm -hmm. for a website that was down, 
but uh, free requests come in at the same time? Is there some kind of locking to make sure you only start it once and you don't lose any requests while it's starting up? Oh, I see. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's, there's locking inside, uh, there's inside our initialized web apps, which uh, handles that. And UWSGI does queue things to a certain degree as well. So we've kind of got a belt and braces there. We use our, um, the code that starts up our, our uh, sandboxes in various places, including these we do in browser consoles and things like that. So we've, got, we've kind of got locking on our side to protect us from that, and UWSGI does a certain amount of queuing. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you currently support WebSockets or persistent connections or something like that? <coughs> no, we don't. Um, and um, that's, that's something we really do want to support. All of, all of our infrastructure does support it to one uh, extent or another. I think um, I'm not actually, I'm not sure what uh, UWSGI support for uh, WebSockets is like at the moment. Um, but I mean, the problem is that the WSGI protocol doesn't really support uh, WebSockets. If UWSGI does support it, it'll be in some kind of extension on top of that. Um, I, th I think that, uh, that's, uh, that's if and when we do so, well, we definitely will support it. When we support it, we'll either wind up rolling something of our own to be able to manage long-running, say, tornado processes and use the same Nginx infrastructure to route through to appropriate places, or maybe, maybe UWSGI will by that time do something that we can, we can use. Um, you you never said how you deal with persistent states or with databases. So, uh, sorry, could you say that again? Well, what happens to the databases of the web apps? And... Oh, I see. Okay, that's 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 managed separately. We have um, <coughs> we have MySQL instances, and uh, we're working on uh, supporting Postgres instances, um, just separate. They're kind of behind those backend servers. Do you have some like, uh, code that manages that? Do we, sorry, do we have code that... Uh, well, that could we, that could we repeat the question, please? Do you have some services that manage databases for users? And, uh, um, on the, yeah, on, on the, the MySQL side, it's all a little bit messy and was built ad hoc for... We're adding Postgres support right now, and we're basically building that as a... Uh, we have a Flask microservice, which uh, runs on um, one of a set of Postgres um, servers, which fires up uh, Docker containers, each of which runs one Postgres instance. So the, so the Flask microservice does the provisioning. Um, we're hard at work on that at the moment. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's working well enough to pass our functional tests, which probably means it's a month or so away from deployment. Last question, please. There's one. Hi. Uh, you said that when uh, one of your instances, uh, you got an alert on it, then you manually removed him from the load balancer? Is there a reason why you don't set up uh, auto, uh, like automatically removal, or, and also uh, if you have uh, auto upscale, because you said that uh, you have some sort of limit on your uh, instances? Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's an excellent question. It's, it's, it's really been a matter of, uh, of, of development time. One of the features we do need to add is, is automatic instance uh, killing. When we first created it, it, was, it made sense to do it, uh, to do it manually because um, you know, each, um, each instant failure was a rare enough occurrence and was kind of unique enough in the way that it failed that it was better to have a human in the loop. Whereas now I think we've managed to get a list of the different ways in which instances can fail and we can probably start building in more automated responses. But yeah, that's, uh, that's just a, a case of we haven't had time to do it yet. So thank you very much, Giles, speaking here. Thank you.